So we're now ready to start our discussion of Spring and Spring Boot, which provide the infrastructure for the web-based application platforms we'll be using throughout the course. I'm going to start out here by explaining what Spring and Spring Boot are. I'll talk about some of the key components in Spring Boot, and I'll also tell you a bit about what microservices are and compare and contrast them with so-called monolithic architectures. So Spring is a so-called dependency injection framework and an inversion of control container that's used to develop web apps on the Java platform. That's what Spring is. So what are these terms? What is dependency injection? Dependency injection is a technique that enables an object or a service or a microservice to receive other objects or services or microservices that it depends on. So you can see here, we've got some client which uses a service and rather than having the client hard code itself to the service, instead we use dependency injection to take an instance of the service or the object and then provide it to the client. And you'll get a lot of chance to learn about how this works with Spring. It's not the only way to do things in Spring, but it's kind of cool and it allows you to make your code more portable, more modular and so on. So the idea here is to do something called auto wiring, where you put actually use a an annotation that says auto wired, rather than manually wiring or manually creating the dependencies in your code. So it gives you an extra level of indirection. And there are some good things and some bad things that come from doing this, but we're going to focus on using it because it's a pretty cool feature of, of Spring. The idea of the benefit of doing this is it separates concerns. So you can create objects in isolation and make them modular and reusable and so on. And then you can use auto wiring and dependency injection to essentially compose your system out of building block pieces, which makes them more loosely coupled, which is a, a virtuous thing from a pattern point of view and a software evolution and maintenance point of view. Tight coupling means that you have a hard time reusing things or understanding things in isolation. Loose coupling means it's easier to figure out what is going on. Often, if you understand how to document and understand the patterns of modular code, because you're not tightly coupling things and making them all put together in a big ball of spaghetti. The concept of inversion of control is also very important in Spring. And what happens in inversion of control is that the Spring platform or the framework owns and controls and runs the main execution thread or threads. So you don't have control of the threads per se, the framework has control of the threads. And this is used to implement something that's widely known as the Hollywood principle. You can read about the Hollywood principle here in this link at the bottom. And the Hollywood principle says, don't call us, we'll call you. So you register certain objects, certain microservices with the spring framework, and then it owns the event loop and it calls back on methods in your code when things occur that require your code's attention. There's a lot of things in Spring. It's, it's mind-bogglingly vast in terms of its scope. Mercifully, we're not going to try to cover all of these things. We're going to focus on Spring Boot, which is basically the, the infrastructure parts that provide platforms for doing communication and concurrency in a networked or distributed environment. And as we'll see, there's two different stacks we care about. One is the servlet stack, which is called Web MVC, and the other is the reactive stack, which is Spring Web Flux. So let's talk about some of the key components in Spring Boot. And these components are really sort of orthogonal as to whether you're using Spring Web MVC or Spring Web Flux. So the purpose of one of the purposes of the Spring Boot project is to make it easy to create standalone production grade web-based applications. And lots and lots and lots of production applications are built using Spring. And here are the main components, client, controller, service layer, and model. The client is typically either a desktop or a laptop or a tablet or a mobile device. It can be running in a web browser, it can be running as a native app, it could be a standalone console-based client, it doesn't really matter. The client will be generating HTTP requests, typically get requests or post requests. And those requests 
use HTTP, which is, as you're probably familiar, hopefully familiar, a request response protocol using a client server computing model, which means that the client sends a request and in response, it gets back a response or in reply, it gets back a response. And that's typically the way that HTTP works. We'll see that there's other variants we'll talk about later that become particularly important in the context of Webflux and its support for asynchrony. But for now, think about it as a request response client server style model. So a client invokes an operation usually using some kind of higher level proxy wrapper. And then underneath the hood, the code is, the call is turned into a request message that runs across HTTP, which is tunneled over TCP. So this request is then sent to something called a controller. And we'll take a peek at the internals of Spring here, either later today or next time. And what the controller does is it takes the incoming HTTP requests and it maps them to these so-called endpoint methods that you write that know how to handle the requests. So the controller is something that is provided to you by Spring, but you provide a little piece of the puzzle here in order to be able to uh, define what happens when the Spring framework maps the HTTP requests that are incoming into the server into the appropriate callback on your endpoint method or methods. Now, what typically happens, there's a couple of different ways to do this, but the way that I like to do it is to have something called a service layer. And the purpose of the service layer is to separate the business logic or the application logic of your service or your microservice from the controller portion that performs the translation between the HTTP requests and the methods that implement each request. So this allows us to write code that really looks pretty much like standalone Java code. And it's also designed carefully to be decoupled from the data access layer and of course the client, which is far removed on the left-hand side here. So you'll get a lot of experience building services. That's, that's the service layer. You'll see how that applies here shortly. And services typically work through dependency injection where they are dependent on other things. And so you use dependency injection in order to connect all the pieces together. So dependency injection is used to connect controllers to services and services to other parts of the implementation, typically repositories or, or models. And the, the model part of this whole architecture is what's used to provide access to persistent data. And we'll see that there's a bunch of different ways of doing this. One way, which we're going to start with, is by using something called the JPA, which used to stand for Java Persistence Architecture, but for various reasons, they had to change that to Jakarta Persistence Architecture for <laughs> trademark reasons. But at any rate, this is something that's really cool, and it's largely automatically generated. It's very easy to work with once you know the mapping rules, and it supports synchronous communication between a service layer and some kind of model, which is typically implemented by a database of some kind, such as Hibernate or Postgres or SQL Server or whatever. We will also see later that there's ways of being able to use asynchronous databases such as uh, R2DBC. That'll come later in the course. The interactions between controllers and the service layer and the service layer and the model are typically just good old Java method calls or whatever language binding you might use Spring with. Spring also works with other languages like Python and so on and JavaScript. We're going to be focusing on Java in this course, primarily so that we can take advantage of all the cool concurrency and parallelism features that Java has. The last thing I want to cover here is just a quick overview of what microservices are. So microservices are an architectural pattern that arranges an application or an app, as it's usually known, as a collection of loosely coupled, fine-grained services that communicate using, hopefully, lightweight protocols. And there's lots and lots and lots to microservices. We're going to cover lots and lots and lots. But for now, just think of them as small, independent components that can be composed and orchestrated together in order to make the system more scalable. And there's, there's a lot more to it than that. A microservice architecture is designed to decompose a larger 
application requirement set into small services that can be developed and deployed separately. So think about uh, <laughs> a tree of cupcakes where you might have cupcakes being thought of as individual microservices. In contrast, the traditional way of doing things before microservices was by using a so-called monolithic architecture where you have a single cohesive app with all the functionality in it that's tightly coupled together into a single code base. So you can think more like those cake shows you might watch where people make a big cake with a bunch of different pieces and layers that they all smooth together, but it's all one big component, one monolithic component, as opposed to being modular, as we can see with microservices. We're going to be using microservices quite extensively to implement a movie recommendation app using Spring Web MVC and Spring Web Flux. And this is just a high level view of one variant of that where we're going to have requests coming in to, to match movies against recommendations that we have produced using some cool AI techniques and machine learning techniques. And you're going to get a chance not so much to work on the AI part of the vector mapping, but you'll get a chance to work on the, the concurrency and parallelism distribution architecture of the solution. That's uh, very cool and very fun. There are pros and cons of applying microservices architectures, and you will get exposed to the pros and cons largely by actually trying it out and seeing how well it works. We'll do our best to focus on the pros, and you'll learn some of the cons as you go. But if you really want to get exposed to these techniques at scale, you probably want to take the cloud computing course that we offer at Vanderbilt, which will focus more on the deployment and orchestration of microservices in the context of a larger environment. We're going to keep our environment fairly simple so you can run your programs on your laptop rather than having to rely on some cloud services. But it isn't that hard to do that also. We just don't have time to cover that in this class and cover everything else. So that's the end of the overview of Spring and Spring Boot.